Okay, um, for those of you who didn't wonder what the test was about, well, anyway, there was a missing root in that one. So. Anyway. I noticed it, but I didn't want to spend too much time on that. Um, yes. Okay, so to, I want to do mainly uh, two things. Uh, further, I want to finally get around to talking a little bit, uh, talking explicitly about the rate at which these things, uh, which uh, uh, reproductive isolation arises in, in uh, specifically in the best data system, which is the Drosophila system. And um, then I'll, I want to turn my attention to some ideas and observations about, um, about how to go forward with uh, studying these kind of things. Okay, so... Um, this is just to uh, formalize how we, how one measures these kind of post mating isolation. You make reciprocal crosses of the two taxa. Usually, you would use maybe uh, multiple uh, uh, accessions or multiple uh, individuals, and and you both replicate this experiment a number of times, and then. But they use a relatively qualitative examination of the data. They've just looked to see whether there are any males survive, and if the males survive, are they fertile or sterile? And similarly, the females from this cross and that. So there, there basically are four individuals, and there are two data points, sequential data points on each individual. Is it alive? And if it's alive, is it fertile? And, and then uh, they have a, a measure of the sort of index of post uh, uh, Post-mating, um, uh, yeah, post-mating, isolating, isolation mechanism index. That's what they call it. Anyway, uh, so this is just to capture the sort of amount of gene flow in a very sort of qualitative way, or, or quantitative, semi-quantitative way, I guess is what they're saying. And this is what's used on an extensive amount of data in Drosophila and other systems. And so this this is the this index right here. And so over here at one would mean that either the individuals are all all the individuals are dead or sterile. And of course, over here is there no effect. But uh, since there's, uh, they all have some, uh, some isolation here. So this is just separating out st sterility, in those that are sterile from those that are inviable. And uh, both inviability and sterility uh, seem to accumulate with <coughs> genetic distance uh, pretty much the same rate. And this represents uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of oh, I think, an order of hundreds of pairs of taxa. Now, the question comes: What about premating isolation? These premating is is tortured by lots of behavioral issues in with animals, and so uh, usually it's not anything that we're terribly proud of, but it has to be fairly simple. And the assay that's used most widely in this in the Drosophila system is basically just to put uh, individuals in a vial um, uh, and let them compete. And so then you're scoring the ratio of, of uh, matings between the same species and matings between, uh, uh, between species. And obviously, if there's complete pre-mating isolation, there won't be any heterospecific matings. And uh, again, that's done with the reciprocal crosses. And you can see here, this is a very striking result is that in, in Drosophila, while the pre-mating isolation accumulates more or less the same rate as the post-mating isolation uh, with genetic distance, um, the sympatric species, in other words, species that happen to occur together, show a very a different pattern, which uh, you can either be very impressed by, and it's certainly a fact worth remembering, but it, in some sense, it, uh, at least in a crude way, it might have to be this way that if two species are sympatric and they don't show a lot of pre-mating isolation, then they will be in the middle of a hybrid zone. In any case, uh, pre-mating isolation arises very rapidly in sympatry. So that's the uh, very sort of fundamental result in, in, in flies and other organisms strive to get the sort of clarity about this kind of issue. Usually they don't have both kinds of data. Um, in their book, uh, Coin and Orb make this uh, this assertion here that this is a sort of effectively reproductively completely isolated when when the pre-mating um, and and the post-mating isolation 
the cumulative isolation is at least 90%, then that they would think that's uh, good, uh, would be a good reproductively isolated species. And I, in reading this last night and thinking about what, what, what's coming, I realized that uh, while this might be quite good from the standpoint of uh, the evolution of, of uh, uh, sibling species in terms of the overall direction of the ta tax, in other words, when a species pair reaches this kind of isolation, for whatever reasons, and obviously a lot of deleterious effects on on their uh, on the fitness of the individuals, uh, they probably are going to uh, continue to diverge and, and remain separate taxa. But I, I also realize that that means that there's 10% uh, even in their good species. There's a, there's, excuse me. There's a 10% rate at which genes could be crossing, uh, intergressing between species. And I want to get back to that in a little while. So anyway, this get, leads to a sort of estimate of about a million years uh, uh, for the species, as we talked about before. And now I want to turn our attention to this issue here: is what are the what's what well, what can we learn about the actual process, biological process that underlies this isolation, and and uh, in particular for post-mating isolate post-mating post-zygotic isolation how, uh, which is, as you'll see in a minute, um, much easier to attack than pre-mating, how rapidly does it evolve, what can we say about how it evolves, and are there, can we recognize certain components or pathways of biology that are contributing to post-mating isolation in some excess or in some unique way. Um, now, one of the most fundamental uh, ideas in uh, in this whole business is the Dubshansky Muller oh sorry Dubshansky Muller incompatibility. So if you have if you have a species that has A A and B B and they make a hybrid A B um, excuse me what do I say A one one and then the other species is. Uh, a1 um, and B11. Those are A2. This assumes that they're fixed for alternative types, then obviously the heterozygote is, is an A1, A2 heterozygote, B1, B2. And the, the, the thesis of, of Dubshansky Muller. Uh, hypothesis about hybrid uh, inviability is that there's epistasis between these genes either in this heterozygous state or of course you will see in a minute a more interesting case would be when you have a homozygote for A1A1 in a background that is B2B2 so that you have homozygotes uh, in general you know genetic effects are stronger in the homozygous setting so this is this is the kind of setting that we're going to be looking at next to try to ascertain that. But it's this epistasis or incompatibility between genotypes derived from the two different, uh, two different species that is the basis of it. And this is a paper that uh, addresses one interesting question, which I haven't brought up, one fact about uh, post-mating isolation in, in many organisms. And this was done in a very simple way they had a pair of species that they could hybridize and do crosses uh, fairly easily between, but there were a lot of sterols, uh, especially in this male sterols. And so uh, uh, they wanted to try to see if they could map throughout the whole genome and find um, as many of these as they could in a fairly s straightforward experiment. So what they did is they took a transposon they put they they put a, the both species had a background in which they had flies happened to have white eyes and then they had a transposon that had red eyes, made the, and they jump they jumped the transposon around the genome. Now they weren't using they weren't going to use the, gene, the transposon to make mutants or anything. They just want to use it as a marker because it will produce a dominant marker, as you'll see, that they can then select in an introgression experiment. So. What you have here is a typical example is right here is here's a fly that now has a transposon homozygous on one species background over here. 
we're going to back cross it, this is Mauritiana, and we're going to back cross that to Simulans and pick up a heterozygote. And then selecting on the red eye color each generation, you can cross those females back to Simulans, and eventually you can get a fly that is very completely uh, Simulans genome except for this one small segment that's marked with the red eyes. And then by making appropriate crosses, you can make a homozygote for that segmental uh, introgression. And so basically they made a lot of introgressions of pieces of the Marciana genome into the, into the Simulans genome. And this is a, a map showing you the many that they, they mapped in the genome. After they mapped them in, they genotyped them to see how big the segments were. And as you can see here from the data, they had a, a large number of lines. Uh, there were 145 lines that they tested for both male and female, and male and female, and, and, uh, and 76 of those were male infertile, uh, while none exhibited female fertility. So this, this is an example of Haldane's rule. Uh, Haldane noticed long ago, including the donkey, I mean the, the, the mule, that the heterogametic sex is more often uh, is more often sterile in hybrids. So in Drosophila, the males are the heterogametic sex, like humans, they have a Y and an X, and so it's, uh, it's typical. And organisms that have a uh, have, uh, CW system, it, it's, um, it tends to, in most of those, or in some of those, it can be demonstrated that they also show the Haldane's rule going the other way. Anyway, so that's one important thing. And then the, the, the other thing that they were able to estimate is that they, they got 15 such genes in that these species, these are very, very, very closely related species, and they already had 15 male sterility fixations in the genome. And now chasing down these, uh, these particular ones is still ongoing. There's been some success. But it, in that case, it's not so clear. But a, here's an independent uh, study of one such sterility gene in that same uh, species pair. And this gene was mapped in, uh, by very arduous genetic mapping. It caused recessive male sterility in the hybrid. And it turned out, after a lot of mapping, that it was a, it was a gene duplication that occurred in the ancestor of all these species, not just the uh, the simulans of Marciana one that they were studying, but the duplication occurred long ago. And, um, and here it was a duplication of a highly conserved gene, which has only 10 substitutions on the lineage going down to mouse and, and C. elegans, two uh, from the time of the duplication in the functional gene. This is the unc gene that's uh, excuse me, involved in muscle coordination, in, at least in C. elegans. But the gene was duplicated, and the duplicated gene, as you can see here, evolved very rapidly, expressed in male uh, gonads, and, uh, and, is a, and it basically shows one of the, several of the most important properties, an excess of amino acid substitutions over silent substitutions, indicating strong selection on the amino, on the amino acid sequence, and uh, an overall very high rate of substitution uh, divergence away from the ancestral uh, genotype. So presumably it's, it's evolving some new function uh, very rapidly. So that's, I think, the most important thing to take away from this, and uh, there'll be a couple more examples, is that they are, these, these genes that people have identified are evolving, seem to be evolving quite rapidly. Uh, one way you could face that is say, well, it almost has to be, if you're looking for the first gene that causes male sterility, it's going to be the one that's evolving the most rapidly. So it's, it's not a strong conclusion in terms of, of, uh, of uh, other than, uh, uh, well, it's a strong conclusion that they're evolving rapidly, whether it uh, has to be that way, uh, how strongly it is and how much bias ascertainment there is, it's uh, difficult to judge. Could you explain why Haldane's rule is true? Huh? Could you explain why Haldane's rule is true? Why what? Why Haldane's rule. Oh, because all of the sterility that was discovered by those introgressions was in males. There were no female steriles. Uh, right, but so something 
so something that's homozygous, or something that's, that's on the Y chromosome, they, are these genes all on the Y No, the, none of them are on the Y. They're not. Is Holden's rule a theoretical prediction? I think that's what you mean. No, oh, no, no it, it's not. It's, it's a, there is a theory that attempts to explain it, and, and that has to do with, uh, with both the dominance, since it's hemizygous, the males only have one chromosome, and it also has to do with the fact that uh, in many organisms, the X chromosome seems to be evolving more rapidly. And so it could, it's a confounding of those two things. Okay. But in any case, the males, uh, the, the heterogametic sex is more often uh, affected in the hybrid. And, the, and that's, a tr that's attributed both to the more rapid evolution of the X and also the hemizygosity of that. Is that true even if the thing that you integress is not on the X or the Y, if it's just somewhere completely else? No, most, in fact, if we go back, you'll see I'm pretty sure that most of that is, uh, can I tell? I can't read it very well, but uh, it's certainly mostly autosome, if not all autosome. So is that understood, the fact that it's affecting a bit which is kind of common to both males and females? Yeah, but the... the for example, you can imagine that, that, that I mean, there's two, two explanations. One would be that the, the, the genetic interactions are inherently more sensitive in males, and that could be attributable to the hemizygosity of males, the fact that they only have one X. But it could also just be true that the, the X is evolving more rapidly, and the males are hemi, in the, in, uh, evolving male sterility more rapidly. Because of selection. So how many generations? Did, oh, generations. I think it would be a million years or oh, okay. something like yeah. half a million years. Two point three. Two point three? Oh, he knows the two point three to up and back or just no, just just up. So it's four million years of evolution between. I, I I didn't understand why. So why there are genes that cause sterility? Is it, that has, is that something to do with this, what you wrote on the whiteboard here? Yeah, it's, we, the, the model for what's going on here is that one species, if you make a particular region in, from, derived from one species, homozygous, in the background of the other species, then these genes will interact badly with one another and lead to male sterility. So, so it's something to do with interaction. Yeah, so like the, the model is, say that the ancestor of both these species was like A1, A1, B2, B2. No, the ancestor is A1, A1, B, B1, B1. So one being the species. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. and so yeah, this one is A2, A, a B2, homozygous. Okay, I mean, sometimes, sometimes with the DMIs, right, you, you say that one gets one, one species, one lineage gets one mutation, the other lineage gets the other. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't so, matter yeah. anyway. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, so, and then, so what you have here is, is, uh, you can think of B for the background in this case because most of the genome is derived from one genome. So many genes are B2 derived from this individual. And we've integrated some small part of the genome from A in there, made it homozygous. Okay. A1 doesn't like B2. Pardon? A1 doesn't like B2. A1, something about A1 is unhappy in, B1, in the B2 background. That's a basic observation. So in genetic terms, that would be epistasis. So interaction between genes at different loci, that's called epistasis. And, and one, of the, one of the things that this experiment doesn't address that's important, but it, it maybe, is, is the, whether the interactions are sort of uh, pairwise or whether they compound. In other words, there are 15 of these things. Is that reflecting some compounding interaction or not? And it's, it's hard to judge in, in, in this case, but that's an open question, sort of how to think about the interaction. Should it just be pairwise between genes or, or uh, systematic? The fact that they're not all in, at least so far, we haven't seen them all in one pathway suggests that they might not be compounding too quickly just because they're different pathways, but that's not directly demonstrated. Okay, so faster, more amino acid substitution indicating Stronger selection. Uh, male or Haldane's rule applies to these. Now, there's a, one of the most, the longest studied uh, hybrid inviability uh, is, the, is the cross between melanogaster and simulans. That 
species is uh, that cross is, produces no fertile offspring uh, normally. And for the last 80 or 90 years, that was the case. But about 20 years ago, uh, uh, Ashburner and Hutter found a strain that actually allowed uh, a hybrid male rescue. And that was a, turned out to be a variant or a mutant. And it's been studied. And then later on in Simulans, there was a lethal hybrid rescue, which rescued uh, the uh, lethality of another one of the genotypes in the cross. And so there are two mutations or variants that have been found in this, this much more ancient hybrid, uh, divergence. But nevertheless, they, are, they rescue. So these are genes that so some change occurs in them, and now the hybrids survive. So they must be involved. Another interesting uh, set of genes, but um, this is its, its founding member in this story is Note 96. I'll get to it in a minute, maybe just brush over it. But anyway, it's a, nether has many properties that are similar. Um, so oh, I'm going backwards. There we go. So this is the third one that I want to uh, talk about. These, this is a, a more recent one, and, and it has a certain another. All of these. Excuse me. Uh, these these genes, well, as you'll see, all are more rapidly evolving. And this is the, one of the more recent ones. This is in a different species in, in uh, Pseudo obscura, and this gene uh, seems to be involved in genomic conflict. It it disturbs and not only causes uh, sterility, but it also disturbs the transmission ratio of the chromosome. So it's involved in chromosome transmission too. And many people suspect that uh, genomic conflict, just because genomic conflict is so strong and can lead to very rapid evolution in a few systems where it's been, been able to study it, that it could underlie a great deal of the observed evolution of sterility, hybrid sterility. guys. Yeah, good. Thank you. Going backwards. Um, genomic conflict is, is, a, is a rubric for um, uh, basically competition or inter strong interactions, selective interactions between elements of the genome directly rather than um, acting through the phenotype of the individual. So uh, in this case, uh, there's a piece of, there's a variant in the chromosome that affects the transmission of the chromosome. It doesn't change the fly, its you know its physiology or anything else. It affects the chromosome's own transmission. Ah, there we go. I don't know. It looks like I got a few blank slides in here. Okay, so. Um, so uh, let me just mention a few things that you may have, or you may know that are go into that. So um, transposable elements can uh, obviously create genomic conflict in the sense that they are very selfish, self-replicating uh, components of the genome, and they compete with the host genome for resources and can they cause mutations when they transpose and replicate. And, and then there are uh, meiotic drive elements. For example, in, in uh, the, one of the classic ones is uh, in uh, corn and maize populations, natural populations, or in agricultural ones for that matter. There are elements on the chromosome that biasly transmit themselves uh, during meiosis. So when the corn kernel is being formed and meiosis occurs, uh, if the individual is a heterozygote for one of these, they're called knobs because you can see them in the microscope. The knob is transmitted more often than the non-knob. So it's, it's not affecting the way the corn plant grows, it's affecting its own transmission, conflicting with, an, with the alternative allele, which is losing out in a very severe battle. So. Okay, so this is just uh, the L, uh, a little bit about the the, what's the proposed pathway for this? It looks like that LHR, the male hybrid rescue and, and the lethal hybrid re rescue, uh, interact together in a pathway. This one is rescuing, uh, this is a melanogaster mutant, this is simulans, as I said, 
and they 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 seem to interact. The the, the this is a, a heterochromatin protein that binds to the centromeric region or near the centromere of melanogaster. And this second gene here is a has a very characteristic pattern here. You can see of uh, these every every uh, whatever it is four eight nine bases. There's a either a leucine, usually a leucine or a leucine-like amino acid. And in this species, there's an insertion in that that breaks that up. And this is actually a protein, protein interaction phase, which the authors would like us to believe is interacting with the, with the, MH, with the HMR to produce the actual dobshansky muller incompatibility. And they, they have genetic data to support that interpretation. Another approach, and by the way, I'm, I'm slogging through a little bit of genetics here because I want to sort of motivate the, the next part. So another approach with uh, Davin Pressgraves and Alan Orr pursued, and Davin pursued much more strenuously, is to take uh, Drosophila has stocks which have different little pieces of the genome all deleted out individually, one stock after another. And they took that stock, uh, those stocks, 180 or more of them, and they crossed them and made it, put them into the hybrid and ask if the hybrid, if it, if it caused a hybrid lethality in, in, uh, in the cross. And they were looking for genes that when they were made haploid, made haploid because they were over a deficiency, they became uh, lethal in the hybrid. And they found uh, a large number of them, or a trove of them, and the best one was this NOPE 96. The reason it was good is that molecular and cellular biologists had already worked very hard on this gene. It's very important in, in nuclear transport and moving RNAs and other particles and things in and out of the nucleus. And when, when they looked at the, at the gene uh, carefully, they see that on the simulant side where it looks like the incompatibility is, might be arising, uh, on the lineage going down to simulans and Marshanet sibling species, there's a, a large number of amino acid substitutions and a couple and a deletion of two base pairs or two deletions. I don't know delta two what it means. I better back away. Anyway, and only eight synonymous substitutions, whereas typically there it, there's an excess of synonymous substitutions throughout the rest of the of the distribution of taxa. So this is a, a large excess of of uh, amino acid substitutions on one lineage and an acceleration of substitution on that lineage. So that, well, it's not really an acceleration compared to over there. It looks like there's quite a bit of substitution going down there too. Anyway, so this is sort of pretty good evidence for, again, rapid evolution in this gene. Now, there are a couple other genes that I, I won't mention, but really we're up to about six or seven in Drosophila that are well studied, well enough studied. And the general picture is that they uh, the genes that have evolved to give rise to sterility, and usually the genes that are being studied are sterility or lethality. There are a couple that are lethality. Uh, they seem to be, of course, favor in males, and they uh, are evolving at a rapid rate. It's still too early to really tell about the pathway. They don't have that much commonality in the pathway uh, or in the biology of the function, so it could very well be that many pathways can uh, be involved, which is the null hypothesis. But the, the, the point that I'm, as I said, I'm trying to make this, this is an enormous amount of work by large, by many very bright, hardworking people. And they've made some progress, but if, if the number of these things is, is high, and the, the, besides the rapid rate, the story about the biology is not emerging terribly quickly, it seems to me that we need to really have a, have a better approach. And I think people have already started in, although they haven't, I don't, I'm not sure it's been thought out very well. And uh, for plants, uh, there's, there are a lot of interesting situations where they could be studied in plants. And again, uh, they're not, they're usually for any one plant species, there's not the kind of resources that it would take to really tear apart one of these loci very deeply. So. We need a little bit better approach to get at it. And I think really the way to go is, uh, is, is to try to mo look at the whole genome in a sort of sequencing context and try to uh, see if we can find a way to identify those genes that are uh, contributing to hybrids 
sterility, hybrid, and viability in the speciation setting. But I think once you start to think about that, then then at least I immediately realized, well, we're not, this extends uh, beyond the study of hybrids or in speciation to really any time that populations become separated and then come back together or any kind of sort of merging of diverged populations where their uh, genes are starting to be mixed from previously uh, d uh, separated and diverged populations. And so we all know about these kind of uh, classic uh, models of, of migration uh, and uh, many of the models can be set up to have periods of isolation and so forth so that we can model uh, and predict or at least have a, a, a road forward for an analysis of the whole genome to identify those regions which show patterns of either introgression or patterns of, of differential migration between different populations that can be uh, hallmarks of genes that are either favorably or unfavorably s selected as a, as a thing as time goes on. So in, to my mind, as sort of the simplest thing is uh, we have these sort of models of migration between two populations or an ancestral population separated and then some migration. And one of the things that I wanted to point out here is that, that uh, uh, in the Previously, the amount of isolation that leads to a good species still allows for a lot of, of gene flow. And if you're looking at the whole genome, and 10% of the genome every generation could be crossing, or even 1%, uh, uh, that would still leave a lot of, of information about that process uh, in the genomes, uh, in the population genomic analysis. And in particular, as species become completely diverged and completely isolated, it doesn't happen overnight. It tapers off. And one can imagine that is that there's still very rare uh, opportunities for gene flow between species that are, because if there are millions of hybrids being produced or thousands, it only takes one to successfully reproduce so the gene can transgress or introgress into the other two species. So I think this whole issue of sort of being cognizant of the differential migration is a, uh, in migration models of multiple populations is a, is a very interesting area, which is uh, a lot of people are getting geared up experimentally, but I don't think the, the we don't have the sort of uh, analytic and st statistical tools to really mine it for each of the kind of biological questions that people might want to ask. And more specifically, we have uh, models of the distribution of genes that are selected in a hybrid zone after secondary contact, but we really don't have a sort of full genomic representation of how to analyze and distinguish those genes that are very strongly selected from those that are very weakly selected. For example, one of the most classic hybrid zone, hybrid in, in a sterility um, um, cases are instances that studied greatly a great deal, including Megan, who's right here, works on it. And the mouse hybrids in the European hybrid zone between Mus musculus and Mus, Mus musculus and Mus Mus domesticus, there's, there, are, there are sterility issues and incompatibility issues, but there's also genes that are involved in, uh, in transmission distortion, and those famously uh, have spread across the hybrid uh, across species barriers, not just the one in, in Europe, which is a mild one involving male sterility, but even more severe ones throughout the range of the genus. And so we have, we know that very strongly favored genes may cross even these very uh, cross barriers that might seem to be quite high. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, I think if you just Google uh, genomic scan of introgression, you will see that this is a, a cottage industry in the last year or six months, okay? And many of the people who are doing it are doing it because they have this, can get the sequencing. They haven't actually got a really good plan for how they're going to analyze the data. And most of the time when you read about this, it's, well, I have a way of finding some outliers. And, you know, biologists, just, you, typical biologists who 
is at least partially motivated by structure of function only needs a few outliers to have the story to work on, and then they're done. But to do a sort of full population genomic analysis of these kind of scenarios is uh, very challenging and interesting. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know, I, I, there, there's, I'm not completely up on the, on the, on the, the latest and greatest sort of tweaking of, of, of models, but I know where to start thinking about this. And, and of course, we had a little bit of discussion of, of, uh, of uh, coalescent modeling and, and fitting, uh, thinking about analysis in the coalescent setting. And this little paper, classic paper, uh, trying to model, look at the distribution of, uh, and this is a data paper that was used this method. And basically, they just take, they're going to look for the, you have the, the observed numbers of segregating sites that are shared by both species, or uh, segregating sites in only one species, one in the others, the numbers that are shared, and the numbers are fixed. And that's, those can be uh, represented in an in a actual a formal expression to, in terms of these, uh, not only the sample sizes, but these parameters. This is sort of whether it's on the X or not on the X. These are the population sizes today, the ancestral, the time, and the uh, uh, gene flow, I guess, yeah, uh, between them. So you can get a represent very simple, that paper had a very simple representation, and they analyzed a very small amount of data, actually, and already, and with a very small amount of data, they already saw inconsistencies between the loci, the few loci that they examined didn't fit a single parameter model. So already there was some indication that the loci didn't really have the same distribution between and within species. Uh, then the next stop on this, I think, is you. You, are you going to be talking about this in the next day? No? Well, anyway, he should be. Anyway, maybe later in the semester. But this, these, these uh, it's a, little, a much stronger extension of the, of the effort to understand these kind of migration models and, and how well they fit. Uh, there's a, there are, of course, uh, we have all, all kinds of issues with scalability you know, once we go to, over to the genome. And then the last thing I wanted to point out was this, this paper, which uh, uh, I remembered, and, and it doesn't, doesn't get cited or referred to that often, but it's very important. And, and Bent was uh, uh, interested, is interested, in, at that time he was interested in trying to understand uh, the differential flow of genes across a hybrid zone. And he and Nick got together and this is a nice little paper where they, they demonstrate and estimate the sort of strength of, or the impact of various numbers of, of uh, loci that are under a selection because they produce uh, less fit hybrids in the hybrid zone, and what the impact of that is on gene flow of linked neutral loci. And they lay out the model quite nicely, but I don't think it's been, as I know, have been extended uh, in a sort of coalescent setting at all that I know of anyway. But it's a, it's a formalization, one formalization of the, of the, the selective part of the, of the process and it's, at least its implications for neutral genes that are linked. And one of the conclusions that they come to in that paper, and I don't know, you know, it's been a number of years it could be revisited, um, is that it really takes a large number of um, the density of, of uh, genes that are under strong selection uh, in the hybrids has to be really quite high uh, in order to have a big impact on the whole genome. Of course, many people will point out that that's, as I said before, many biologists would be happy with just a few regions of the genome that showed a really big effect, so that's not necessarily a, a killer, but from an stand, overall standpoint, it's be important. But I think the other, it's, n it's not my idea, but it's in, I bring it to you because I think it is the, the time has come and people are actively trying to uh, use genome scanning to uh, uh, f look at this hybrid uh, inviability and hybrid uh, uh, isolation, the origin of isolation and the, and the impact of the isolation genes 
to use the whole genome scanning and, model, and hopefully modeling to uh, get a better handle on, on the process. Because if we're going to do one gene at a time, we may never actually have a, the big picture, let alone a genomic representation of, of, of uh, speciation genomics. And with that, I'll retire. Okay. We have, we have some. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, if a gene is identified in one particular species, say species A, yeah. uh, that is known to be involved in hybrid lethality, um, what are the chances that it can also be involved in hybrid lethality? in another closely or distinctly related species B and C. Mm -hmm. Say between Drosophila, you find a gene <coughs> which is involved in hybrid lethality, yeah. one particular Drosophila mm -hmm. strain, what would other Drosophila strains have? have yeah. I think, I, you know, I, I think, I guess the well, first thing I would say is what I, uh, what I, I think I said at the beginning. I mean, it's 15 years to get six genes, right? And so to, to take one of these results, and one of the genes is a new gene, right? So it's not, uh, you're not going to, the, well, no, the, the Odysseus gene rose in, you know, it's a duplication, so it's not in the other one. Uh, but the NUP genes, I think one could, and I don't know that any NUP genes have been tested for hybrid, uh, hybrid sterility, specifically in other species. Yeah. But... It's the manpower, horsepower issue, and so few of them. That's why, you know, for example, if, if you wanted to know whether NUP showed, say, reduced introgression across hybrid zones, in, in if you had five hybrid zones, you could do NUP and another 13,000 genes simultaneously with the sequencing project and know pretty quickly, at least if it's a big effect that's shared between a number of them. So I think that's exactly the sort of thing I'm driving at there, but it's, uh, it's, it's sort of such an obvious problem to bring genomics to bear on uh, now that I think of it. Any other questions? Yes, um, Just curious about more about the Odysseus story. So after the duplication, um, did the the separate copies, they one, uh, one maintained its time-honored role in muscle development, uh -huh. and it doesn't seem to have budged an inch. It just does what it does, more or less unaffected. But the duplicated copy evolved very rapidly and with a lot of amino acid substitutions and became expressed in the testes and probably someplace in the brain. Uh, so it has... It has new function, the, new the function. It's neo-functionalization. That's interpretation from the expression pattern and the phenotype. But, but that one, you know, uh, I would say about all of these is that it's hard. It's been hard work to get them, and it's actually my impression is it's been hard work to understand them, because the papers don't come flowing after they get these things. And when you talk to them, you know, they have new function they didn't expect, or the different genetic backgrounds give. So they're hard to work on, and not only are they are they hard to get. So again, I'm, I think it's it's not a it's not the kind of activity I would I recommend you know, people start their career off doing is chasing down these genes. Pretty hard work. Yeah. Well, Chuck, I, I like this uh, you know, genomic scam. We're doing some of yeah. it ourselves. Scam, you said. <laughs> <laughs> genomic scam, scam yeah. But but the problem, as you know, is is uh, there are other things, I mean, there are a lot of things that can lead to differences in, in patterns of differentiation, some of which are directly related to speciation, and many of which are not. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, Wolfgang showed years ago that, uh, you know, hitchhiking in, in Drosophila and Anassi leads to differences in levels of differentiation, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. So, uh, if we're looking for the genes that restrict, that, that are directly involved in reproductive isolation, they're going to be a subset, and maybe a very small subset, of those that show high levels of differentiation genome-wide studies. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, how how to address that. Well, I I think that is a problem when you're thinking about a sort of general 
I mean, for example, let's just take Drosophila throughout the world and we're going to sequence a whole bunch of them and try to make a demographic model. I agree. That's the problem. But I think a hybrid zone is a very special kind of situation because there you're not talking about the level overall. You're just talking about the differential diffusion or non-diffusion of a, of a variant that you know exists here and is not over there. And so while I think there are things that you know better than I, there are lots of things happening on the hybrid zone that might not be incompatibility. I mean, in the sense of there's ecology and you know things that are not about mating and but maybe other things. But uh, in any case, I, I guess my own view would be that's why God made theoreticians and analysts is to figure out how to analyze the big gobs of interesting data and you know you can do this whole experiment and convince you know somebody to do the analysis in the in the four man years it takes or woman years or whatever it takes to get another incompatibility locus mapped and things so I at least think we ought to have a parallel path and I think it should be you know I, I, I like I said when you google it you get the distinct impression the, the sort of a lot of people are just going ahead without a plan or a model or anything. So I think it, it's, a, it's a very good time to sort of start to make really concrete models. And I think the issue of the, that you raise of sort of the general population analysis where you just have subdivision and migration, that one will be more difficult, I think, to, because there things are not set up in a sort of a dynamic tension across a hybrid zone. Do we, do we know that the uh, initial uh, hybrid incompatibilities are driven by like a small number of loci with large effects? No, we, what we know is that geneticists will work on a, on a small number of loci with large effects. That's what we know about genetics. <laughs> That's what Mendel did and everybody since. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chuck. Yeah.